So today, um, my goal is to be able to provide you with some information on how uh, reactive programming can be applied to existing environments and to existing applications. It's highly unlikely many of you have the opportunity to do completely greenfield development all that often. And even when you do, it probably has to be quite localized and you can't apply it to your entire system. And some of you may think your systems are like this and need to be turn, uh, burned to the ground. More than likely, your systems look like this. They're big, complicated systems that have been around a long time, accruing uh, different components and functionality over time. And it actually is a very uh, sophisticated uh, system that, that does its job and works well. But you've got things that uh, have been added over years by lots of different engineers, different approaches. And uh, you, but you may want to be here. Now, if you are already here and you have this image, I may not be able to help you much today. I have actually never seen a system do this. You, you, my goal is to maybe bring these flying ships into the last picture so that we can uh, take the traffic jams and, and add a third dimension where we can start to go concurrently over the city. A few years ago at Netflix, uh, we were trying to solve some problems with our, uh, with our API tier. The, uh, the tier that I work in in edge engineering at Netflix is responsible for all the traffic that, that comes in the front door, serves all the devices, all the set-top boxes, all the smart TVs, and uh, that means that we're, uh, we're serving all the web service traffic. And what we were seeing is that a lot of that traffic uh, was, it was very granular. We'd done the right thing with REST, and it was all very granular, resource-oriented APIs, but it was very chatty and that was causing problems for us. It could take up to 12 network calls to uh, load a single, the, the single home page for the grid of movies. And the back and forth latency of all of that and also the duplicate work that was being performed all, across all those different calls was problematic. And so we went down the path of, uh, of optimizing that. And we wanted to be able to embrace concurrent execution on the server side where network latency was far uh, lower is we were able to, to benefit the, uh, the data center latencies rather than over the WAN, over the internet. And also because we were able to do it one place, we were able to shed a lot of the, the redundancy that would uh, happen across all those different requests. And so we realized that we needed to uh, have asynchronous behavior in our system. Up until this point, it was very limited how often we would kick things off in parallel. Every once in a while, we'd have a future off doing something. But in general, it was mostly a, a synchronous request response model and we weren't leveraging asynchrony. And so we, started, we, we knew that we needed callbacks of some form. Uh, in effectively, at a concrete level, whenever you have asynchrony, there's a callback somewhere that's going to call back to you when something is done, rather than you blocking and waiting on it. In reality, though, what we were looking for was service composition. And what service composition meant to us is as we uh, reached out to all the underlying microservices in our ecosystem uh, over I.O., we wanted to compose them all together into what the, the user device was asking for, and we wanted to do that uh, and leveraging concurrency and efficiently, uh, efficiency. And the reason why we wanted to do it was not for any um, uh, ideal, uh, idealistic reason. It was purely to reduce the latency that the user experienced. That was the sole reason why we wanted to do that. But we, along the way, we also realized that we had to uh, uh, handle these last two points. We had to deal with error handling, as a lot of uh, asynchronous programming models just make it, they don't really treat errors as a first class citizen. So we had to handle uh, errors gracefully. And we also needed to take into account developer productivity. Developer productivity uh, is a big deal at Netflix because we, we actually optimize for rapid innovation above almost all else. And so the, the speed at which we can get code written and out the door uh, it shows itself in every aspect of our architecture, our continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment, uh, the microservice architecture, all these different aspects allow us to move very quickly. And we optimize for that. Also, writing the code the first time is honestly the easiest part of any system. Long-term maintenance of it is a much bigger concern, and that's where I typically see most of the pain in systems over the years. And so the first six months of a project, when you're in the honeymoon phase, everything is easy and glorious, and then you end up with that picture of the city, and everything we wrote six months ago becomes what we call legacy. And so how do we actually make it so that we have an asynchronous system that we can reason about and operate and use, and I, when I'm called in at three in the morning for some production issue, that I can actually grok what is going on 
and, and manage and operate it. Because that's the reality of, of big scale systems. So we, we realized quite quickly that raw callbacks were not what we were gonna do, even though fundamentally that's what's going on. We were all very familiar with and comfortable with futures. Uh, and this is circa Java 6, Java 7, uh, which is what we were using at the time. The base future in Java, though, has some problems. First and foremost, effectively the only way to do anything with it is you immediately block or you have to pull, neither of which are actually achieving our primary goal of being able to have asynchronous callbacks. And so we knew that we couldn't use them. The other thing too is that futures don't actually address this use case that we have in a lot of places where it's actually a list of data that we need to get back. And returning a future of list, it does get me the list in the future, but it doesn't actually let me compose over it and it doesn't let the data come back uh, asynchronously. And that actually shows up in quite a few places in our environment. So that, that example I gave you before that we were trying to solve where we might have 12 network calls that came in, we were trying to collapse it into one. The, the stereotypical pattern that it goes through is it gets a list of list of movies, which we uh, call Lolomo at Netflix. So that list of list of movies, uh, we, we descend into it and we uh, for each over or we iterate over the outer list and then we get several dozen inner lists. And think of this as the grid, if you've ever used Netflix, it's the grid of movies and you go you know, vertically and, and uh, horizontally on it. And so now on, we're one level down and now we're for reaching over all the movies in each of those lists. So it's a double nested loop. Once we're down at the movie level, we're then uh, fetching data for each movie from a lot of different places. This is exactly the type of thing that, that we're trying to deal with. And so in reality, we're like, we start to get into this weird world of we want a future of a list of a future of T, and that's just awkward and wrong. It does not work very well. Thankfully, we had enough um, diversity of engineering talent across the teams that we were collaborating with that uh, someone uh, named Jafar Hussein, who had come over from Microsoft uh, recently at the time, was able to, uh, he, he spent several months arguing with, with us over the fact that we were heading down a wrong path and he was able to educate us on the theories that Eric Meyer had been doing over at Microsoft uh, with his reactive extensions. And after several months of exploring that and coming to understand that the theories uh, actually really made sense and hung together quite well, putting aside just any concrete implementations and biases in that sense, the theories and, and the computer science behind it just made sense. And so we decided to adopt this observable T uh, interface signature as basically our, uh, as the interface to represent all of our asynchronous work. And this led us to a mental mindset of treating everything as a stream. Everything is a stream of data that's flowing back at us, and whether it's one item or uh, a finite N, like 10 items, or an infinite uh, stream of data, everything is a stream that then we transform and compose together using functional operators. So I'm gonna use uh, this, these particular functions for a variety of examples as I go through this. So different from what Netflix typically deals with, we don't deal with orders and products and shipping status like this, but I imagine several of you do or have had to at some point. So it's something we can uh, relate to. This particular example is similar to when I go to the Amazon page and I look at my, all the orders on my account. It's gonna fetch all the orders, and then for each order, it fetches all the products in each order, and then for each of them, it's fetching the uh, shipping status. And it's actually, uh, I can tell that somewhere it's fetching shipping status per product because they allow their, their orders to be shipped independently as to when they're available. So to do that, this is a pretty typical API that we might have. And these blocking API calls, uh, this is exactly the type of stuff that we dealt with. Uh, this is how our code base looked. It was all API calls like this. And so you have get orders returning a list of order, get products that takes each order and gives you back a list of products, and then finally you can ask for the shipping status for the, the combination of orders and products. Well, the way that that looks if you just compose that together is you end up with code that runs sequentially like that. So if, shipping, if get shipping status takes 400 milliseconds like I did here just so it's visible on, on the screen, now, some, I've seen some places where it's low tens of milliseconds. I've seen others where I'm hitting mainframes that take multiple seconds for this kind of data. But you end up with this sequential waterf uh, waterfall model of the data flowing in because you're within four loops and each time around the loop you're, you're kicking it off. Now, obviously, I can go off and start spawning threads and those types of things and 
There's a lot of different ways of solving this. I want to show you how, how we went about it. At the time when we went down this path, this is how our environment looked. We, all of our inter-process communication was done over Apache HTTP. Our uh, memcache clients, uh, even though underneath they're actually doing asynchronous work, all of the public APIs on the clients expose either blocking calls or at best a Java future that you just immediately block on with .git. Then we, uh, the Cassandra clients are blocking, Tomcat and servlets, everything's blocking here. So the question is, how on earth do I start to get this reactive model into a, a code base that looks like that? And honestly, there are a lot of things we couldn't go and start changing. Uh, realistically, a lot of this stuff was entrenched into our code base, and we didn't have enough experience with it. We were impacted by the dozens of teams around us that were providing us client libraries or infrastructure and all these things. There was no way that we were going to go and greenfield this thing or rip and replace all these different pieces of code and convert them over to uh, asynchronous and non-blocking. But we, we did have control of the service layer. The service layer, which is at the very top of our app, which is the part where all the web services hit to basic, it's a facade into the entire ecosystem, we did control that. And so we decided to create an async facade on top of uh, all the Netflix functionality underneath us, and that async facade gave us a place where we could bridge between async and synchronous. And so if, we, if I think of our code base very sim uh, simply, it, we ended up having these three different layers running within our system. At the top, we had basically the servlets and the, and the Tomcat model, and then this async facade that we put in, and then all of the rest of our code underneath. And we just ignored it. We didn't try and go and change it. We didn't try and refactor any of that. Uh, we just used the, the, the client libraries and platforms that were already there. So what would this look like to go from blocking API calls like get orders to making them async? What that looked like for us is converting these APIs into observable APIs. And so what that would mean is that where I might have get orders returning a list of orders, I now want it to return an observable of orders. Where I had shipping status, get shipping status returning the type T shipping status, I want it to now return an observable of shipping status. This then allows us to write code that looks like this, where that get shipping status function, which before was being synchronously invoked, I now have an asynchronous one that, is, that it actually just declares. This is completely lazy. Nothing happens when you actually run that method other than it constructing something that will run later when I tell it to. And that gets composed within another async observable stream, which is composed within yet another one. This composition is exactly what, uh, what this particular use case requires. It does actually need me to compose two levels deep to, to get the combination of orders and products so that when I finally get to the shipping status, I can, uh, I can fetch it. Now, there's different ways of going about this, but this is a fairly straightforward approach to just seeing how it flows. So when I run this code now, it has a very different, uh, different execution pattern. When I run it, it, um, I'll do that again. It starts, and then 400 milliseconds later, because everything's been kicked off concurrently, everything snaps in place. So instead of it stepping through the function one at a time, it's allowing that uh, shipping status to asynchronously be fetched. And in this case, I'm just being very naive in allowing it to run on multiple threads and connections on each one. And they all run concurrently and all be get gathered back together. And the coding model abstracts away from me the, the complications of uh, the threading and the, and the joining of all of that stuff. And it allows me to actually declaratively to say how I want to compose it, and that was important to us. So if you remember, one of my original goals was service composition. So here I'm able to declaratively compose together the, the various services, how I want them to, uh, to behave, and then the, the, the runtime takes care of the concurrency. So let's dig down in, uh, the next level and see what that looks like to go from a blocking to non-blocking API. So if I want to take shipping status, which is a scalar method that returns a single item, and I want to go to an observable, one of the easiest ways of doing it is just to, to wrap it. And in this particular example, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use some of the observable operators to do it. And so observable is the, is the core type of, of Rx. And defer does exactly what it sounds like it does. It defers execution of the body of code that it is given until later when it is subscribed to. And so it allows me to lazily define something to run later. Then an important part here is I compose onto it 
uh, where I want it to be scheduled, where I want it to run at some point. And so in this case, I use the subscribe on operator where I say, when you are subscribed to, do it on this scheduler, which is suited to I.O. And in this particular case, the I.O. scheduler is effectively just using an executor service under the covers that does cache threads. And so it will grow as needed for I.O., which is generally what you want, and it will reuse them as it can. Then when it is subscribed to, it pushes, it puts the work off on one of those threads, and then it executes the get shipping status method, uh, just as normal. And then when it returns, it gets uh, swallowed up by this observable.just, which is effectively saying just the response from get shipping status and return that. So now, what if I wanted to actually have a, a list of values rather than just a single value? So in this case, the list of orders, very similar approach. I want to go from list of orders to observable of order. And so in this case, exactly the same thing. I use defer again. I still want to have subscribe on to put that work off on another thread because I'm invoking a blocking uh, API call. And then when I call get orders, it's going to return to me an iterable, a list of, uh, a, a list of orders. In this case, I use from instead of just, because I don't, if I use just here, it would actually return an observable of list of orders, which is not what I want. I want an observable of order, so from takes an iterable and turns it into a stream, just one item at a time out of that. So the, the first principle that, that we uh, adopted was just use native threads and wrap all of our blocking API calls in the threads and hide that from the actual developers who need to deal with this. Because one of the premises we also had was that as much as I like the Java concurrency and practice book, and it's one of only two books that I still have in paper version near my desk, most developers have no interest in reading it and should not be worrying about semaphores and synchronization and mutexes and all of that fun. Even at the higher levels of executor services, it really is the wrong thing if we have two dozen, or in our case, potentially 100 different developers all deciding when they're gonna start launching threads in our system. All hell will break loose if we allow that kind of uh, free-for-all to be going, be going on. And honestly, most uh, engineers just aren't comfortable with figuring that out as how everything interacts in a system. So we needed to abstract that away. This helped us achieve that. We can go one step further, though. The wrapping of threads, that's like the, the bare minimum, and, but it doesn't actually get us super efficient on the streaming of things. So if I have a JDBC call, let's take a look at that. Let's say get orders. Under the covers, this is a method I can control, so I can change the code. If it's a third-party client library, obviously, all we can do is wrap it and, and we're done. But if I can control the code here, JDBC I can't change. That's blocking. That, that is not going anywhere anytime soon as far as being a blocking API. But how I interact with JDBC, I can adjust. So this get orders method, as it's currently implemented, it accumulates all the, the results from the result set into a list and waits until everything has been accumulated and returns it. There's two potential issues here. One is that you are allocating all the memory up front and then passing it on to the next uh, thing, which if you're only pulling back three or four items, that really doesn't matter. But if you're pulling back potentially thousands of items, all of a sudden the object allocation and performance of that does start to be noticeable. Secondly, this by definition prevents us from doing anything more efficient such as streaming the res results as the database is giving them back to us. So we can rewrite our interaction with JDBC to be in more of a streaming model instead. So in this case, we take an observable and we're gonna create, this is how you create an observable from scratch. If you have nothing else already to, to just wrap around. So you create it and then within that Lambda function, we are given uh, the, the subscriber, and within that result set loop, instead of me accumulating and collecting it into a list, instead I'm going to on next it to the subscriber as I receive them from the result set. Then I've got the terminal states completing either successfully or with an exception. And I also have, important here, especially if you notice the select star from orders where I'm just pulling the entire database, this allows me to, uh, and that is just for sim simplicity on my slide, in case any of you are wondering. Um, in this case, it, it will correctly unsubscribe. So I could do something like pull all orders from me, but take just the first 10, and it will correctly shut everything down and clean up resources. And then because JDBC is blocking, I do compose onto it the scheduling to go and subscribe onto an I.O. scheduler. Otherwise, this would all be synchronous. 
Now, I do want to give you a glimpse of the more advanced version of this that goes one step further. And this is something that when we started three years ago was not an option. And uh, the, the RX Java team collaborated with others in the industry, including TypeSafe and Twitter and Pivotal uh, on the Reactive Streams project to create a specification of how to have back pressure in an asynchronous system uh, such as this. So the code definitely becomes more complicated when you start to put in place back pressure in a system like this. And so what we've got is because Java doesn't give us any uh, benefits like async await, like C sharp and those types of things, we have to build the state machines by hand. And so we've got some code that helps with those state machines. And so this particular abstract on subscribe, which will probably get some API sugar on, on top of it in the coming months, um, but it's functioning today. It basically tell, gives a mechanism for handling the state of that result set. You create the state and then you, it allows you to iterate over that all in a way that will correctly handle back pressure and it will run as fast as the consumer can go. So I'll explain that as we go through this. This particular block of code, this lambda, is given a, a subscriber when it is subscribed to. And what it says is you, you are executed once in the life cycle and you're allowed to start up and create whatever state you need for the system. Uh, sorry, for this li the life cycle of the subscription. So the first thing is it does is it fetches a connection and then it creates a statement. In this particular case, I'm creating a statement that allows it to stream. The default in a lot of JDBC drivers is that they'll just swallow everything whole and so th they don't actually stream anything. In this particular case, we want to stream it. So an example, years ago when I was uh, still working with MySQL databases, if you weren't careful, you would end up just bloating your memory as you pulled down the entire database into memory before it would actually give anything to you. With these incantations, you can tell it that you want to stream the results with a cursor and it will only pull them as fast as you're consuming them and so the memory usage is far better. And that's exactly what we're actually wanting to do here. So then it, it creates that result set by executing a query, of course with whatever complicated query you would want. And it, all it does at that point is it just sets up the state for this subscription. Then what this, what this does behind the scenes on your behalf is it then deals with the pr producer-consumer relationship between them so that as the consumer expresses its ability to, eat, to consume data from you, it will sit there and on next down to the, to, to the consumer. And so this block of code will be executed on your behalf whenever the consumer is ready for more data. And typically the, the way that that works is that there is some level of uh, bounded buffering that, that exists in the system. So in Rx Java, for example, it defaults to buffer sizes about 128. And so at any point where there's an async boundary, it will allow up to 128 items to be in flight somewhere in the, in the stream. And so the first thing that it does each time it comes in to say on next is just grabs the stateful object, it gets that state object, which is the result set, and then it does the blocking call on it, it says move your cursor to the next row, and if there is a next row, it will then on next it out, otherwise it will complete, or if it blows up, then we catch that error and uh, we emit it. And so this is the bridge between the blocking API and the, the non-blocking API. Try catch behavior around a blocking call that can throw, and then it, it takes that error and signals it as an event down the observable stream. Because in Rx, an error is just another signal, it's another event that is passed down a stream, they're never thrown. And then, very important, there needs to be a back channel on the observable. On, so uh, the stream is bidirectional in the sense that down you're sending data and up you're receiving subscribe events, request events for back pressure, and then uh, dispose or unsubscribe events. And so that event that comes back up to tear it all down is what then gives you the opportunity to both cancel early but also clean up resources. And that's essential in these async systems because otherwise you have no idea when you've completed work. And so this allows us to shut down and terminate the result set and, and do any other cleanup we need to do. And of course, because all of this is, because JDBC is blocking, we need to take all this code and, and put it off on an I.O. scheduler. And what that allows it to do is it says, move all this JDBC behavior off onto another thread, so you'll block that thread, but you'll behave asynchronously as far as all the service composition is concerned. So what I've shown you th so far is the ability to use some of these, uh, these particular operators that Rx Java offers to be able to take existing blocking code and envelop them within the observable API. 
Defer allows you to, de to declare the, the code that you want to execute when it's subscribed to. From and just are, con are taking existing data values and, and wrapping them in observables. Subscribe on is for moving work from one place to another. And then create is when you want to start to get into uh, the lower levels of creating it manually and you're interacting exactly with the specification itself. But what about the servlet layer? So I've talked thus far about how we deal with the bottom half of the code and we, we cover it. How do we deal with the servlet itself? So if we look at a servlet definition, we've got code like this where we've got an HTTP git with the, with the request and response coming in. And we want to do that async service composition. And, but all this code has to be blocking. If we, if we release, uh, if we return from this, the servlet is done and we've released that thread and we would have async code off running somewhere and then when it completes, it would have nowhere to write the data back to. And so we need to bridge between these two worlds. And this is exactly the kind of code that we still have running today in, in Netflix. Because um, even though we've been doing it for three years, we still are in this bridged world where it's the servlet that comes in, we kick off all this async wor work, and the servlet thread just sits there waiting for all that async uh, service composition to complete, and then we write it all out and then release the servlet thread after it's done. So this particular call, we say a ver uh, we want to go get the shipping stash for this customer order, and we want to do it asynchronously with this particular parameter, and that method call returns an observable. And so this entire block of code is declarative. Nothing actually happens when you, when you run this. All it does is it just packages up this lazy uh, declaration of this is what I want to do when I am run. So it gets the orders asynchronously and it composes together everything as we looked at earlier. When this is returned back, now I, I introduce you to the two blocking operator. And the two blocking operator is explicitly named like that so it is very clear in your code what is about to happen. So it, it used to be, uh, like in rx.net actually, they've got the, it, it's mixed on the same observable interface, you've got methods that block and some that don't block. We decided in RxJava to be far more explicit about that. And anything that will block the current thread you're on, we force you off to go to two blocking and it's on a blocking observable API so that you know what you're about to get yourself into so that when you're reading through code, it stands out to you. And so this two blocking, what it does is it gives you access to a variety of method signatures such as for each and for each then allows you to block the current calling thread and iterate over the responses that are coming out of it asynchronously and write them out to the, the, the writer on blocking I.O. And then because for each moves you back into a blocking model, instead of receiving the error as a signal, it will throw the exception so that you can have your, your imperative try-catch blocking uh, error handling and uh, behave accordingly. And so two blocking is, is used for bridging between asynchronous and synchronous code. And it allows you to go back and forth between these worlds. So how did it work for us adding reactive to an existing code base? Well, when we started out, it, uh, the first couple tries were hard. We actually took a device, uh, one of our devices, we've got dozens and dozens of, of clients and devices and UIs at Netflix. So we took one of them that wasn't too big, it wasn't too small, we needed enough traffic that it, it, we would actually prove it out. So we took one and we rebuilt it from the ground up, top to bottom, the entire, all the web service interactions, all the service calls, uh, and, and all of the, the, the UI uh, requirements for it. And we built it twice and failed. The third time we succeeded. Still very ugly code when I look back at it uh, a year or two after the fact. But by the third time we, we, we got it and we learned a lot along the way. This is how we felt while we were first going through it though. Um, particularly the other engineer who was working with me on it, who had not been involved in the initial discovery and thinking about the reactive programming model, it was effectively, why the hell are we doing this? This is hard. And uh, that was kind of how the first two uh, attempts went, as we stubbed our toes and made a lot of mistakes, and it was ugly. By the third one, though, it worked. And what we were able to prove is that the tech did work, and that particular engineer came out of that and actually became an advocate of it across the rest of the engineers after he had gone through the learning curve and grokked it and realized how much more powerful it made it uh, for us to code these kind of APIs uh, and services. However, there was a bunch of things that we learned as we went through this. First of all, we really had to relearn a bunch of idiomatic approaches. Most of us had 10 plus years on that team of programming in Java, and so we had a very imperative mindset we 
we thought in you know, the existing Java syntax. And so we had to relearn approaches. Something as simple as a for loop, which we all just took for granted, we had to relearn how to think of that instead as uh, functions that are being applied to a stream, like the map function, for example. That we stopped thinking in loops, and we started thinking in stream transformations and composition. Or error handling, we had to stop putting try catch. Some of the, uh, the, the worst examples of our early attempts is people would be writing async code, and then they'd put these try catch blocks around everything, and completely, they, they weren't even realizing that, that, that the code would like flow through and the try catch would never in a million years actually catch anything because the code was, was done, like it had moved off and it was off onto some other thread. And so then they were wondering why errors weren't being caught properly. And so this was another one of those idiomatic things that we had to unlearn and relearn a, a new approach and learn how to use error handlers on the streams themselves. We also learned that we had to invest in documentation. And so we actually hired a tech writer. And the tech writer came along and helped us make our Java docs not suck. And, <laughs> and um, he, he's awesome. Three years later, he's still working for us. And as we write code, the developers will do their best to, to put in Java docs. And he'll sweep in after the fact and do pull requests and commits against the GitHub repo to flush things out and fix our grammar and, and put in diagrams and those things. And then over time, it evolved into uh, wikis and, and websites such as these that have proper documentation for how on earth all this stuff works and how to use it and how to think about it. And this was important because we were, we were basically saying to dozens of engineers across the company, if you want to build web services on the Netflix API, you have to use this, uh, this approach. This is how it's going to work. We also had to allow for time um, and mistakes. You're taking engineers with 10 plus years of experience who are excellent at what they do, and then you're telling them that they need to learn this new paradigm. And not everyone was fully on board with that idea at first. And so this time and mistakes bit and allowing for technical debt to accrue in those early versions of, of web services and code was something we just embraced. We recognized that that was going to be the case, and not everything was going to be pretty and achieve all the goals. And this is partly why I said earlier that I've never actually seen something end up with that futuristic city landscape. Because that's what we might have in mind and we always end up building, you've seen the comics of what developers have in their mind and what they end up building. Um, and so this was, was important for us to, to address. Also, unit testing and debugging. I want to talk about these two because they often come up. So async unit tests actually work really well uh, with Rx. And so Rx gives a few tools that make it so that you can uh, unit test these asynchronous streams and deal with concurrency so that it's actually usable. So first off, this test subscriber, you would actually never use this in production code, but it's there in the library. You use it, it's purely for unit testing. And you declare this code, like this interval code, what this is gonna do is every 200 milliseconds, just gonna increment a number, spit it out at you. It takes five of them unsubscribes, and it's mapping into strings. And so when we subscribe to this, that's actually async. So if you were to run that and not block, your unit test would just return, and you're like, what happened? And it's off running on some other thread somewhere. And so if you, you could start doing like two blocking and things like that manually, or you can like do countdown latches all by yourself and all that stuff. But this is such a common thing that the test subscriber just gives you mechanisms like await a terminal event, either on complete or on error, assert that no errors occurred, and then assert that I received uh, the, the on next events as, as expected. And so the unit tests end up all looking more or less like this. Well, we, you can go one step further though if you actually have concurrency going on. And this is where there's a, something that Eric Meyer designed when, uh, when he did Rx originally that is pretty powerful. It's the ability to have virtual time. So in this example, we've still got the test subscriber there, but we've got this other thing called a test scheduler. So all concurrency in Rx is, per, is parameterized and it uses virtual time. It never actually directly uses executor services or like system current time millis. It never directly uses those things. It always goes through an abstraction of a scheduler. And what that allows you to do is completely take control of time. And that's useful in two use cases. One is when you're doing unit testing and the other one when you do want to do like historical processing of data where I can take like 24 hours worth of data and crunch through with all my temporal based operators but do it in like 10 minutes of however fast I can pull the I.O. through. I'm not going to spend time on that feature, on, on that use case today, but in this case, with unit testing, I, I inject 
th this parameter into that interval, every place where concurrency is going to be used, there are overloads to say, I want you to use this different scheduler. And there's also plugins in Rx that allow you to like swoop in from behind and change all the defaults. And that's useful, for example, when you want to say, the default behavior, I want you to run off on those event loops over there instead, like on the Netty event loops rather than off on your own event loops. This is where it gets cool. You actually advance time uh, deterministically. And so I advance time 200 milliseconds, and I can deterministically assert that it has emitted one value. And then I, again, deterministically advance time again, and I assert. Now, I've just moved time ahead 1,000 milliseconds, caused it to emit five items. But in reality, this only takes like microseconds or milliseconds to execute, because it's not actually doing real scheduling on any, uh, on any CPUs. Async debugging, on the other hand, is still hard. Uh, this is not a solved problem. You get ugly stack traces. So for example, that's a little small on this, I'm sorry. Um, Java 8 lambdas, they're great, but they don't show up great in stack traces. That is just, uh, that is just a thing. There's nothing about Rx, but it's just a thing. When you start using Rx, you've got a lot more lambdas in your system, typically. And so stack traces end up looking funny. You also end up with, <clears throat> excuse me, you end up with the start of your stack all being like, I'm scheduled off on this thread, so the thread started me. But you have no idea what actually told that thread to go do its thing. And so as I'm hopping between threads, I completely lose the context of what told me to go do this. You can end up with stack pollution. A lot of frameworks do this, but it exists here too, especially because you're doing composition of functions. You end up with your stack showing a whole lot of library code and not a whole lot of user code. RxJava does try to help out. Anytime there's a user function that fails, we try and give reasons as to what value was flowing through when it blew up. But it's very limited what it can do. Step-by-step -step debugging is an absolute disaster in async systems. And this is not uh, just in Rx that this happens. It's just as a general rule, anytime you have multiple threads and, con and concurrency, step-by-step -step debugging is fundamentally broken. In this particular case, <clears throat> If you put a, de a debug up on the top there, sorry, not debug, a, a breakpoint, and you step through this, you'll actually follow through as it declares all of your operators, but then it won't follow it at all when it actually runs and starts passing data through it. Nor will it actually step into the function that you actually care about. So if you want to actually see when it gets there, you have to set the breakpoint in the very particular user function that you want. As a result of this, we basically never do step-by-step -step debugging. Um, it just doesn't work. Unfortunately, the state of the art is pretty well console logging. Um, and this is sad. But <laughs> there, is, there is work in progress in here. It hasn't been the highest of priorities for us. We've accepted this as just the reality of it. it our, in our systems, too, we had actually almost given up on logging anyways, because in a distributed cluster of thousands of machines, the logging was, it was just broken. And so we typically just use uh, real-time insights, and we tap into a single machine and feed data out as we care. And so we've, we've embraced different approaches to it, but it's understood that this is a problem. We're exploring different approaches with some different um, engineers and different companies on how we can get async, uh, like basically get logical call stacks. And a, and a logical call stack would stitch together the various uh, thread stacks, rip out the, the library frames, and weave together the different threads. Now, we've actually done that with plugins and stuff like that, but it completely murders production performance when you do it, because getting a stack trace in Java is horrifically expensive. Even if you do it down inside a, a, a JVM plugin, a hook, like a, a, an agent, it's also a massive performance hit. I mean, we're, we're, I'm not talking percentage points. I'm talking like orders of magnitude performance hit. So we're exploring some options with some other folks who have done a lot in this space, and it gets crazy complicated. I really would like to see the, the industry improve how our runtimes can deal with these types of things. I share this just so you understand that if you're getting into async and concurrency, you're going to run into these problems, and you have to do your trade-off. So how did it look once we were all done? As we were building on top of this very big, sophisticated uh, thing that already existed, and we were adding this whole async layer on top of it, how did it work? What we found is the observable APIs actually work really, really well for us. And today, 100% of all of our traffic flowing in through Netflix to all of our devices flows through observable APIs. And over time, it has pushed itself deeper and deeper into our stack so that now our Hystrix fault tolerance layer is all implemented with Rx. 
and, and we're starting to bake it into our networking layer as well. We were able to go from call patterns that look like the top to call patterns that look like the bottom and reduce the number of incoming calls, expand the, the amount of concurrency and parallel execution that we do server side, and do it all in a way that was just async service composition. <clears throat> The type of code that we ended up writing looks somewhat like this. There are, I've got other presentations out there if you want to dig into some of the deeper details on this, but the, the next 10-ish slides will be just kind of a summary of, of some of those aspects. This type of code allows us to, uh, to come in, th this handle method, if you'll notice, that handle method is the, um, this is all async. This, this particular one is not exactly what we run in production, so we've not yet done our green field. This would be what it would look like if I was to take what we've done and then level it up one, one further. And so this is fully async, and so we fetch a user asynchronously. We flat map over it. What flat map does, if that's one of those things that explodes your head like it did mine when I first encountered it, and it took me forever to understand what on earth it does, it's actually not that complicated. All it is is a map function that each time around you apply a function to it, <coughs> and then it returns the value and then you, you flatten them all back into one stream. So if you return, and, uh, think of it like if I have a function that returns a bunch of observables that are all async, it then like rips the values out of them and just merges them all back into one stream. And so it returns an R and I get a user out of it. And then within that, I return, I, I, I kick off all this work that I want to do asynchronously and then another bunch of work that I want to do in parallel. These things are independent. Within that catalog, and then flat mapping again. So this is what, what I told you earlier, that double nested loop of uh, list of list of movies and then list of movies <coughs> and then for each movie. Here I'm now down to the movies and then for each video I go and fetch all this work that I wanna do and then I, you'll notice that each of them are returning observables and then I zip them together. If this is completely scaring you, that's okay. Today, my, my goal is to show how to apply this into existing systems, not necessarily to walk through all the aspects of this. You can go and find a lot more information on this particular stuff as to how this all works. Zip is really quite elegant. It's taking multiple asynchronous streams, and it's just uh, waiting for them to, uh, the important thing there is it's waiting, not blocking. It waits for them to all come back, and then it gathers them together, and then emits another event down the stream. And what that ends up giving us is we merge this all together, which takes two multiple streams into one, and then out the bottom, we're able to just write all that out, and in this particular case, each movie is actually emitted as a different server sent event on a stream. So as the data is flowing into the system and composing, out the bottom end of it is just a stream of data that is emitting one, uh, one server sent event at a time. And so we replaced all of our blocking APIs with non-blocking APIs across our entire uh, service layer. I want to talk about some of the challenges, though, of mixing these approaches. So mixing async and synchronous like this does, does come with uh, s some challenges. One of them is we ended up with just way too many threads in our system. Like, seriously, I have an eight-core machine with, like, 1,200 threads running. And that's just insane in so many ways. And it makes it hard to tune the system. It, w the only way we actually can figure out where the system is going to fall apart is by squeeze testing it because it can't get to 100% CPU utilization. Just the thrashing of that many threads just kills it long before it can get to the point where I can utilize the machine. And that makes shedding load hard, because what on earth do I use as a metric to shed load? If I can't use CPU, I can't really, like, load average is the best I can get, and that's like the most useless metric ever. And so these are challenges. It also makes it so that our latency percentiles can kind of jump around, and so we have to be careful that we don't push our machines too far past the happy point so that we achieve our stated goal of concurrency without killing the latency just because the thread scheduling is going off the rails. It's also, when you have a mixed code base like this, it's easy to accidentally block your async code. And so in this example, it's concurrent on the top and synchronous on the bottom. Flat map and map, you'll notice the differences there. And the call that's being made, that get shipping status, if you leave APIs lying around in your code base where I can get the same thing synchronously and asynchronously, this will happen. Someone will commit code and run it in production where you end up completely destroying all the benefits that you sought to achieve. And we've had this problem happen a few times in prod where we had this beautiful code that was running concurrently and low latency and then it goes out the door and then like what the hell happened? It's, it's back into a step function and we had to go and hunt down where that happened. 
So I'd like to, uh, in the last part of my talk, I want to talk about how we went fully react, uh, how we've been exploring going fully reactive. And uh, just a time check, I was asked to not let you out for lunch right at the, the normal lunch time. They want to stagger out there. And so I'm going to go until nearish that time and then let Q&A happen afterwards. And they said that the reason for that was so that we don't have a, a rush on the food. So if you start getting antsy and looking at your watches, that's kind of what I was told to do. <laughs> so what about doing a greenfield and us going fully reactive and non-blocking? Well, as I started to research this, I found it was all just myth and legends. Man, is this a hard topic to actually get straight answers on. I've spent a year of my life trying to hunt down and slay all the myths and legends on here, and I feel like I've only progressed a little bit. I go to companies and ask them, well, so why are you using Netty and non-blocking? Because like, it's better, obviously. Well, that's not a very useful answer. Like, I seriously would walk away just like, mm -hmm, okay. Like, I'm not sure I'm ready to use that as my reasoning. Then I talk with other people, like, it's totally worse. Don't do it. I'm like, <laughs> so I'm two competing views here. Then I get others that were a little bit more reasonable, and they're like, it really doesn't matter. They're all the same thing. And like, it all depends on your use case and all that stuff. And then I start reading about this, and then there's like all this stuff. And uh, green threads are fascinating, but we don't have them on the JVM. Um, native threads all I've got. Fibers, and, like, fibers do not work in the JVM today. So like, any attempt to try and make it, until the JVM offers it, we don't have them. And there's the actor model and event loops, and the current OS kernels, and all this stuff. And the interesting thing as I studied all this is I got to this point where I kind of realized the argument was effectively, they're all theoretically equivalent. Like mathematically, they should all behave exactly the same because if you have a certain amount of work to do on a certain finite number of CPUs, if the behavior of scheduling and running them is the same, you get the same throughput and latency out of it. And actually, I, I agree with that argument. Unfortunately, the implementations don't match theory. And that's where all the complication gets in. The only agreement I really got out of anybody is if you're trying to solve the C10K problem, which is the, the number of concurrent connections you hold on a box, you effectively just don't do that with blocking I.O. You don't do this with thread per request. You use event loops for this. Nowadays, though, people are tackling, this is like a decade ago, people are now tackling C1 million and beyond. Uh, and so I know teams, uh, not at Netflix, but in other companies, who actually sustain a million plus connections on a box. And I read recently some are trying to get to 10 million, which is just baffling. So I was asking the question of what should I bet the future on? And if I'm going to be influencing something here, like this is the type of thing that in a code base like I, I work on at Netflix, it's gonna be around for five to 10 years. Like that's the pace that you change networking libraries at. It's a big deal to, to swap something out like this. And I didn't wanna bet it on myth and legend. Uh, even though there's some really good myths and legends out there. And so uh, I did the dangerous thing of trying to actually like performance test what this stuff looked like. And man, everyone told me I was doing everything wrong. Every, every critique and opinion that could be had came out of the woodwork when I started going down this path. Essentially what I was testing for is the types of use cases at Netflix where I get an incoming request and I kick off work concurrently and gather it all back together. Huge number of systems that, that I work on and that the company uses do this. So kick off two things in parallel. When the first one comes back, go do two more things. When the other one comes back, do another thing and then compose it all back together as JSON. And so that I use JSON here so that it was representative of the type of things that we, people were doing. Lots of strings, lots of garbage allocation, serialization time, all that stuff. Um, so I wasn't gonna like try and do better than what I knew most of our production systems were doing, like efficient binary encoding or anything like that. I just use the type of stuff that we do. And the theoretical best time you should get out of this is 154 milliseconds. That's the theoretical best. If, if there's no overhead, that's what you should get out of this. We, we did this on EC2, and then we eventually moved to just uh, our own just hardware sitting somewhere, just so that we would have access to better tooling around the performance uh, monitoring. With EC, all the, the virtualization on EC2 limits the type of stuff you can get from CPUs and cache lines and all that kind of stuff. And so we tested Netty and Tomcat. That's, we weren't trying to be comprehensive. And so, disclaimer, this is for us, but it, I want it to show you just representative of uh, what we have found. As we did the tests, we were able to push the CPU usage of both systems up to near 100%. That's a good sign. That means that both of our systems were able to max themselves out. 
When we first started, we actually couldn't get Tomcat anywhere near this. We had to do a lot of tuning on it to get it to that point. But after a bunch of tuning on Tomcat, we got them both so that they were running efficiently. This is where it starts to get interesting. The CPU consumption per request on Netty is uh, quite a bit lower. It's measurably lower than uh, Tomcat. And uh, Netty achieves a higher throughput, and it's mostly, as we measured it, it's mostly due to the CPU consumption per request. And where that comes from, I'll get to that in a second. The, the other measurements, average latency, so I know average is like a totally useless thing, but average latency shows that they're both right in line with the theoretical best when they start out, and then Tomcat starts to fall apart uh, worse than Netty. Where it really is, uh, shows what's going on though is when you look at the max latencies. Max latency, Netty actually does pretty, a pretty decent job. It's, it, at its worst, it's about uh, three to four times slower than best, whereas Tomcat just falls off the rails. It falls over and dies, and that's, that's our experience in production. Those kind of curves, that's how my production servers fall over dead um, when we push them too hard. CPU instructions per cycle, which is, this is how much work the CPU is doing each time around the loop when it's doing a, a request, is, it, interestingly, it starts out lower for Netty, but as it gets put under load, it gets more efficient, and it's actually doing more work uh, per time around the loop, than, whereas Tomcat gets worse over time. And this is the one that really shows what's going on. The thread migrations between the two start out very similar, and then they start to diverge quite quickly, and it's, uh, it becomes 10 times more thread migrations on the uh, threaded Tomcat model over Netty. So both are under, under light load, both are quite similar, and then they start to diverge, and interestingly, the more load you put on the Netty one, the, the less thread migrations it does and the more efficient it becomes, and it actually speeds up as you push it into 100% CPU. And so why? We spent a lot of our time asking why we were observing these things. And I, I don't have time today to dig into all the different data points and all the graphs and flame graphs and all that stuff. Someday we will post a huge comprehensive blog post and all this stuff. Um, we did all this with Brendan Gregg, who's like an industry expert on this stuff. He's written a book literally this thick on system performance. I'm positive he has forgotten more than I will ever know in my life about this stuff. And uh, he was able to help us recognize that first of all, object L, like just Netty is a more efficient framework than, than Tomcat. We had to spend a lot of time getting GC tuning right on Tomcat, whereas on Netty we didn't have to do any of that stuff. So GC cost is definitely a, an aspect. Next, the event loop architecture, uh, this was my big question. Does the event loop architecture actually help? And we found that yes, it does. Uh, with all those disclaimers I gave earlier with our current operating systems and JVMs and all those things. We had uh, reduced thread migrations, and uh, that, the, the, the lower th thread migrations and contact switches, are, the symptoms of that are better cache warmth, memory locality, instructions per cycle, which all lead to lower CPU consumption per request. On the thread pool side, we, we could actually measure lock contention, and we could measure the thread migrations. And we could see all that happening in all of our flame graphs and like breaking down where the CPU time was going. There's a lot more to this that um, anyone who has spent time on this will start asking in your heads right now, I'm sure. Um, but basically what we learned is that with the current JVM implementations that we're on and with the current Linux kernels that we're using, event loops do have efficiency benefits. I'm totally okay admitting that theoretically we should be able to make them all behave similarly, but as of today, this is just where we're at. Along the way, though, I also realized something else. Using the event loop model, I found it's actually simpler, even though it's not easier. It's easier to get started with threads just because I've got 10, 15, 15 years of experience in writing code with threads. It's the, I reach for it, I understand it, I grok it, it's mentally like, it's just second nature. So that's easier, but it becomes far, far harder as you scale a system. Whereas the event loop model and the async model I found is it's got a higher initial start. You have to like get over this hump, but once, once I found that we get over that, then it kind of plateaus out, and then it just like deals with life and just moves forward, and once you've figured that out, it's pretty easy. What's interesting is it actually looks very much like its max latency curve. Not only does the max latency curve do this, but I would say like how you operate your systems looks like this too. Our threaded models, the blue, just like their max latency spikes, the difficulty in operating them and tuning them does that. When it's small and light and not much going on, they just work. 
when, when you start to like figure out how to really push these boxes and deal with like uh, these huge um, waves of traffic that are crashing upon us and dealing with retry storms and all those types of things and shedding load in production, I have found it is pretty tricky to get it right. So we found that a fully async architecture does have benefits. However, moving back to the, the uh, I, I shared all that just so that you can get a glimpse of the fact that there might be reason for you to consider that if you have opportunities uh, to do greenfield on certain aspects of your system. The core uh, thing that I want to share, though, is that reactive programming can be applied to your existing systems. That's what's running today at Netflix. It's almost, yeah, it's over three years now that we've been doing that. It's a mixed code base. It still is Tomcat. Most of our I.O. is still blocking. We're slowly starting to move clients to it. This next year is when we're going to start to really double down and start to move away from the blocking I.O. to non-blocking I.O. And our goal is to get from 1,000 plus threads down to the number of threads that we have cores. And then we're going down that path, but we're a couple years already down and invested into this. And so we now feel comfortable doing that. You can do this and, and get benefits out of it. Part of it, too, is RxJava is a library, not a framework. And so you can incrementally apply it. You can use it as little or as much as you want. It does not define how your application works. It is viral in the sense that once you start going down the path of trying to be async, you, you soon start to find that you want everything to be async. So it's viral in that nature, uh, just like using futures or anything else that is wrapping around something. But it is not thrust upon you how it, you architect your system necessarily. You're completely free to use um, threads or event loops or whatever you choose underneath. Mixed code bases do come with challenges. Take note of that. Uh, it, it's bearable, but just uh, keep that in mind. Concurrency via async service composition works. We've been able to improve our user experience latency by doing this, and it's a very powerful way of, of modeling our code. I didn't spend any time talking today about some of the other things that we were able to do with this, but here's just one brief example uh, that you can ask me later about it if you want or look up in my other talks in online. We're able to leverage the asynchronous behavior of these, of these compositions to under the covers auto batch all of the network calls. So that in some of these places where it looks like I could be kicking off thousands of network calls, under the covers we're actually windowing them and just we automatically collapse them all so that we do these batch calls. And, you, and the question that sometimes gets asked is why do you do that automatically? A big part of it is because developers are trying to declare what their code should do, not think about the, the system impact. The other thing is that how you interact with systems is often decoupled from how you are actually using the data. And then, the, honestly, the most important reason, when I have dozens of engineers all working on a code base, trying to figure out like, the right place to like, do a batch call is really hard. It, it, just, it always gets messed up, because one developer changes this thing over here and this one over here. And if, you're, if, if it's you by yourself writing a code base, you can get it all right. I don't see that in larger code bases. So we let people declare their code as it's supposed to be used, and then under the covers, we just window and batch everything. You can't do that when it's synchronous, because you, get the, you just synchronously steps through it. When it's all async, you can just window everything, like every millisecond, every five milliseconds, and just batch it all. Or you can even, it, what we're, where we're headed, we'll, we'll have persistent bidirectional networks, which you don't have yet. Then you just start sending frames across existing networks. That's all made possible by having this async model. Leverage the RxJava schedulers and threads. You can easily take blocking APIs and make them asynchronous. Or you can go and use Hystrix. This is actually what we did. So those examples that I gave of defer and subscribe on, we actually don't do that in, in our environment because there's more to operating a system than just asynchrony. There's also bulkheading and um, fallbacks and circuit breakers and all that stuff. That's a whole different topic but we actually use Hystrix to, to isolate and bulkhead all of our blocking I.O. Uh, we actually have a, a monitor in our system that is like bytecode sniffing uh, the blocking I.O. Uh, APIs, and if anything goes across there without Hystrix involved, we start firing alerts, because that means that we're vulnerable to an outage. And so we have everything actually going through Hystrix. In, in, in closing, though, concurrency is it's non-trivial. We're not taking that away. And Rx doesn't trivialize it, but it does give you tools to work very uh, work with it well. It gives you powerful tools. It does have a learning curve. E embracing asynchronously and reactive programming is not as uh, it's not as easy as just imperative. But if you get over the learning curve, I'd argue that it's simpler in the long term 
uh, to achieve the things we're trying to achieve. And hopefully it will allow you to at least uh, get parts of this vision. I don't think any of you are actually gonna build that because that's just not what we as developers do. But hopefully you'll be able to take pieces of this and drop it into that uh, earlier picture. A lot more information can be had on blog posts and websites and various things. And I will post these slides online and then I know Phil ET uh, will do so as well. Uh, the hour is up, but uh, because of the, uh, the lunchtime delay that they want, I will take questions for as long as you wish to be here. Actually, request that done. Do you have like a way of pacing? Yep. So, how are you able to identify that it's happening? So, we actually leverage Hystrix for all of that. So, the way that works is that for any given um, uh, API call that we're going to make, you define it as a collapser. It, if you go look at the code, you just look for the collapser. And behind the scenes, it then is, it treats it as an asynchronous queuing uh, mechanism and it drops them in and then fires them off asynchronously and then calls back and it does the multiplexing, demultiplexing so that you define basically how you're gonna demultiplex the, the batch response when you get it back into however many things were built into that batch. So that's actually all part of our open source code in Hystrix. Okay. Yeah, and it just was the natural place for us to do it and it actually came out of our resilience efforts because for resiliency, we needed to have small or no queues, but these batch, the, we had these bursty behaviors and the bursts were causing us to have to have big queues just to handle these like little micro bursts, but then that made us vulnerable to uh, failure. And so the collapsing came about actually not as a performance optimization originally, it came about to make it so we could keep our queues at zero and so that uh, we can have a consistent uh, rate of execution through our system. So that's why it's part of our resilience library. Will the code work as effectively without pandas? I know you mentioned you lost some visibility in the pandas. Um, yeah, it, it works just fine without lambdas. Lambda just makes the code readable. So actually for our first couple of years where we didn't have Java 8, we were either um, having massive amounts of anonymous inner classes in the Java side, or we were using Groovy um, to get their, uh, their Lambda support. So yeah, it works just fine. It's just that's purely syntactic sugar. It doesn't actually affect the functionality at all. So I guess uh, one of the implications of making these changes is a caller that initially might make like a thousand calls one at a time might try to make a thousand calls in parallel to some downstream service. Mm -hmm. I guess you say patching prevents the abuse um, to some degree, but is that, is that the answer? It's not the only answer. There's also mechanisms for restricting the concurrency. So, um, so RxJava supports the idea of, of uh, think of it as vertical back pressure. So any given stream, it's going to restrict, it's completely, un, uh, it's completely bounded buffering. There's no point where you could have an unbounded buffer in it. But in your, if you're merging a bunch of things together, which is effectively what's happening when you're kicking off a bunch of uh, like a thousand calls, that can easily happen if you have a stream of like a thousand items and then you flat map over it and then you kick off a thousand things concurrently. And so you could end up with one of these scenarios where you burst a thousand things. And if you can't do collapsing, then you, pro you may very well not want to do a thousand things all at the same time. And so it supports basically, like on flat map, you can just add an overload to tell it to limit your concurrency. And so then it will do like eight at a time or 50 at a time or whatever like that. Can you kind of case by case that? Once it gets that one, yes. And the reason for that is actually quite complicated. I could tell you a little bit more later. If I, if I was to try and restrict those um, automatically, we risk uh, deadlock or starvation for some really complicated edge cases. And so that's such a rare scenario though, that generally what, what most of the time you're saying is go do all this concurrently. The only time really that it becomes something a developer has to think about is on like infinite streams or, or where it's like, it's just this fire hose of data and then you like risk bloating out the side with all the connections. And in our, in the, in our world, that's pretty rare. You're typically dealing with like hundreds of things. In our stream processing system, on the other hand, which we've built all on RX and Netty, that is a concern. We have just this infinite stream, and you do have to take into account uh, the concurrent execution. So I could point you to some of the documentation around that if you if you like. How did the uh, how did the adoption of this design pattern uh, affect some of the, the clients that are consuming uh, the APIs, and how did you guys manage that? Because I'm sure it's a number of teams. Also 
also So that wasn't so much related to, it sort of was related to Rx. It was more related to our desire to go from like a dozen REST calls to one thing that they declare. And that actually is a much broader aspect of our architecture where we allow the UI teams to actually write code that runs on the server and they write their own web service implementation effectively. So that was a negotiation between us and them saying, you don't like how you're currently dealing with this, but we can't possibly write custom web services for every one of our dozens of endpoints. And so we basically turned ourselves into a platform as a service where they, they write that adapter layer, think of it that way. And then the, the argument was over, well, how are we gonna expose it all to you asynchronously? And Rx came out of that as part of the, the interaction between them, and they actually adopted RxJS on the JavaScript side and so we use Rx both server side and client side. And so it actually has worked out very well for us. But it, did, it didn't, because if we had just ex continued to expose RESTful endpoints, it would have been completely hidden from them. But yeah, they would, it's just a, a network call for them. But because we threw them into the mix of writing code, that's why I say like 100 plus engineers, it's not just the API team who's doing this. All the UI teams also are writing code against these observable APIs. Any attachment of the same multiple subscribers to the same observable? And is the attachment from Robin or each of the subscribers get the same So the, the question is basically if you have multiple subscribers to the same observable, what's the behavior? So the default behavior is each subscription will be its own independent lifecycle. It will kick off whatever the work is. So and most observables are considered cold, which means that they, they're doing nothing until you subscribe, and then it invokes the lifecycle. Um, if you want to multicast it or make it hot, a hot stream is one that's it's firing data whether you're there to listen to it or not, and that's effectively what you want when you want to multicast. So in a multicast scenario, there's operators to, to, to share or publish data to multiple subscribers, and in those cases, when multiple subscribers come in, then it will just uh, effectively just round robin over them, and it'll just iterate through the list and just keep uh, giving them, and then you can choose to make those async if you want, and you can get crazy complicated if you want. Um, and then it also provides tooling for like, sometimes you need to make sure that you have three things subscribed before you invoke the work so that they're consistent. Other times they can just come and go. So all those different uh, approaches, there, there's tools uh, for multicasting that support all that. So, so you use this to make that protocol. Other than RX and do you know any other HTTP client that's more than React? Um, there is the Apache HTTP client that has gone uh, async, and it's it's good. Uh, in fact, that was the first one I experimented with. Um, retrofit, but retrofit is, yeah. I mean, retrofit might work for the server side. I've never heard of it being. That's predominantly for the Android side. Uh, but Netty and Apache, and then retrofit are really the only three I've spent much time with. So the question is why, why we had two failed attempts. Um, honestly, the code was just brutally ugly and didn't work right. Um, it was things like try catches around async code, and like error handling is wrong, it was um, wrong concurrency patterns, just we didn't understand what we were doing yet. How did you decide, like, how did you convince the business to, like, go? Because I have awesome management. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, how did we convince uh, our, our management to let us do this? And honestly, the, the answer is that the executive chain above me, they're very good at setting the context and then empowering us and trusting us in our decisions. And if, as long as we can demonstrate evidence that we've thought through what on earth we're doing, they're pretty good about letting us um, uh, apply our work uh, to, to achieve it. And, then, and, and as we've gained trust over time, that, that, that flexibility and trust has increased, so. So, I didn't see an example of it, but how something like, if I have, let's say, four endpoints and services somewhere, and I'm kind of gonna hold it and then the first one will be back, right? Use that one and then you're requesting and just throw away the other ones? So the, the question was, if I had four different endpoints and I wanted to kick off work to them concurrently, and then just whichever the first one that comes back, just return and cancel the other three, right? Um, you can use the AMV operator, 
It, the A and B operator literally stands for ambiguous from like computer science days past. And so you drop in as many of these observable things in there, it runs them all concurrently. First one comes back, it emits it, and then uh, unsubscribes and cancels the other ones. So, um, clicking around for ArchJava, it's really cool. It's built an endpoint. Um, it did sort of the scenario you get, get a set of order, a list of orders, uh, you go through good products, and you get a response. The thing that I ran into, though, was once I had this observable of what I wanted in the end, how do I then turn that into my output? Like, I sort of naively thought, you know, a natural response might be a JSON list of these order options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do you have a bunch of things streaming in and you want to accumulate it all as one thing? Yeah, and then actually then turn it into, like I said, a single response that's, you know, JSON that's sort of compiled all of them together. Yep, so the, there's a variety of different ways you can do it. One is like you can literally just like do dot two list, dot map, and then you can just work on everything as a list of T. And, and oftentimes that's actually better in mixed environments because you've already got code somewhere that knows how to take a list of T and serialize it into your JSON. If you want to uh, be more functional, uh, you can use the dot collect or reduce methods as so you create your stateful object and then you accumulate it over time. That can be beneficial if you have a serialization model that actually can do it incrementally. Uh, if, you are, if you don't have an incremental way of doing it, then there's no benefit to doing that. But so look at collect and, and reduce. And then the, um, uh, the, yeah, I mean, those are really the two approaches. And it's like a dot map function is like if you have this list of T, and then you go from list of T out to JSON string. And so that, like, it really comes down to those, those approaches. So I noticed you were doing what looked like server side events. Yeah, in one of the examples. Is that how you add Netflix? Not yet. So the reason why not yet is it's a really crazy hard problem to do that at scale, to have that many persistent connections. We, that was that C10K problem, which I am in process with my teams building out our infrastructure to support millions of concurrent connections to do that. At that point, we'll be able to move away from today where we just collect everything up. It's really quite unfortunate. We've got all this stuff that's like streaming in this side, support streaming on the JavaScript side, and then we accumulate it into this big JSON thing and throw it down, and it's, it's like sad. Um, and so once we have, uh, we're going to establish WebSocket connections and then just do message passing. And so then we'll stop doing the to list or collect step and then just emit each item as, as each, so like for example, an order, it'd be order dot map into JSON or whatever you want, some, or binary encoding, and then you just keep passing that one item over the, the connection. So if you have SSE or WebSockets or TCP, prefer uh, the streaming model. If you have just HTTP one request response, then you have to collect it all um, it, and uh, it, with two list or collect or something like that. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, I guess what I'm trying to wrap my brain around is the sort of the is RX the right tool for the job scenario or is it like a philosophy? Like would you would you build a recipe organizer for your mom using RX? Because that's just like the way you think it out. Or is it the right tool for the job in a massive so I'm, the question is, is it the right tool for the job or uh, is it actually just like uh, the, the correct philosophies for programming? Um, my mind has shifted enough to this model now that it's how I think. And so I prefer the, the, the functional style. Like even if it's the Java 8 streams API, instead of uh, a for list, uh, a for loop over a list, I prefer it. Um, even though the stream API is, has its issues and it's blocking and all that stuff, so it doesn't achieve what we need it to be. I have, my mind uh, now thinks in function operators. So even if I was to do a recipe thing, you know, for a family member or something, I, I would just do that because now it's, it's, I have come to realize how simplistic it is to think in this way and how powerful. Um, now for that particular example, performance probably doesn't matter and concurrency probably doesn't matter, but I would argue that that's orthogonal because it becomes a programming model at that point. Um, as far as the implementation of Rx itself, there's a lot of different things. Like if, if Java 9, for example, were to come along and completely absorb all of this and take care of it and just make it so that I've got all the, like for example, like what C Sharp did in .NET, 
great. Move on to that. It's, it's the principles, not so much the library. We did the library because there, there was a, a void. And our goal, like we're, we're starting to talk now about what RxJava Java 2.0 would look like with just a few little tweaks based on like what we, the Reactive Streams collaboration stuff. Our goal is basically to be, as long as the Java, the Java language itself does not have that solution, that we want to provide a world-class de facto uh, implementation of uh, async streams. So. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>